this video, I'd like to discuss with you how you should be analyzing your driver inputs and how you should be reading the balance of the car from these inputs. Hello, this is Bruno. I'm the lead performance engineer for Optimum G. So let's start by discussing what we want to look at. First, we we are going to analyze speed traces to understand where the driver is gaining or losing time or is struggling with the car setup. Then we are going to be looking at steering trace, throttle technique and braking technique. So first, by looking at the speed, as you know, we can identify where one driver is losing compared to another. So we could look at the, the speed trace and identify that, for example, the comparison driver in red is gaining time relative to our baseline, but then it's losing time in this traction zone and we can keep analyzing this for different parts of the track. There is a more effective way of doing this, of quantifying how much time he's gaining, he or she is gaining or losing. And here we could be looking at variance. So the variance is going to be telling us how much time the driver lost or gained in different parts of the track. So if this number is going up, it means in this case that the right red driver is going faster. If the number is going down, it means that it is going slower. So we can see that in this braking zone that we saw that the driver in black is losing time, we can quantify how much time he's losing. So it will be from here all the way until here. And same for every section of the track, we can identify that. This is good to understand up until that point how much time a driver lost compared to the other. In this case, one of the drivers would have lost um, half a second up until there. But there is a better way in which we can quantify instantaneously how much time one driver is losing compared to the other. This is a very interesting channel that we, sh we call variance gain. With variance gain, which is basically the derivative of the variance, we can identify in that specific point how much time that driver is losing. So this helps us quantify while before we needed to look at the inclination to understand if the driver was losing a lot or not a lot in each of the sections. Now, instead of looking at an inclination, we calculate the derivative and we look at the absolute value. So for example, we can see here that the red driver is gaining a lot in this point and then this other section over here and this other section, while the driver in black is gaining in these other sections. So this channel makes it very efficient to identify where we should be working on with our drivers. So the next point, once we understand where one driver is struggling compared to the other, is to read the driver inputs. How should we be reading steering traces? So let's assume a baseline neutral car, and we would have a steering profile like this one. If we have an understeering car, typically the driver is going to be steering more and it's going to have a more peaky shape, something similar to what we are seeing here. So why does this happen? Because the, the front axle is going to be the limit. So the driver is trying to get more rotation from the front axle, but nothing's happening. This is why you see this peakier profile. One thing we have to be very careful, very good drivers, even with an understeer car, he or she is not going to steer a lot more than the peak of the tire. So when we speak about peak of the tire, we are speaking about lateral force versus slip angle. And we are going to have, as you steer the tire, the front axle, we are going to increase the grip up to a peak. And if the, the car is understeer and the driver is steering a lot more than this peak, it is not helping them find extra grip. It is actually decreasing the grip. So even when the car is understeer, a small amount of sliding of the front axle is acceptable because the driver needs to feel the peak of the tire. But anything past that can be very detrimental to the tire. And it's what we call over sliding or over driving. In this case, you are sliding more the tires, which generate more temperature because of higher energy. And it also induces higher wear. So the car that once was just slightly understeer, if the driver keeps sliding the front axle, it's going to induce this higher temperature and wear, which is going to make the car even more understeer. And then he's steering even for further and you just destroy the front tires. There is one specific situation in, in which this technique can actually be helpful or you want to do that. When you have very cold conditions, you might want to do some sort of overdriving to put more energy, energy into the tires and, um, make, and get higher temperatures that would actually help with your grip. 
Now, this would be an understeering car. The oversteering car would be the opposite. We would see less steering because the driver needs to be very careful with the front axle not to spin the car because he has a lot more grip on the front compared to the rear. So what we typically see is less steering, so lower steering than the reference lap, and also some oversteering corrections as we can see here. So this combination of lower steering plus corrections is going to give us an, in an indication that there is oversteer balance there. And then we can use this information to connect with driver feedback and with all the other information that we get from logged data or even from the tires. This oversliding can also happen on the rears, not only on the front. And again, you have to be very careful because if you're sliding too much the rear, having to apply too many corrections, you are probably sliding it more than you should. And this is going to increase the wear, make your car even more oversteer. So there is another steering characteristic that we should be looking at, which is, let's assume again, our baseline steering for a neutral car. Many times we're going to see a steering profile more like this. So there are different causes to this that would explain why the driver is so um, aggressive with the steering or applying so many corrections. Number one, because he's driving at the limit. When you are driving, driving at the limit and you have a balanced car between front and rear axle, it is normal that the front is going to grip slightly more and then you need to correct and then the rear and then the front. So this is why the driver is always making adjustments to the steering wheel. In this case, it would be normal. The second cause could be really because the car is oversteer or unstable. So any um, bumps on the track would make the car go oversteer and the driver needs to correct. Or the third possibility is that it is the driving style of your driver. Some drivers, they will feel the need to be applying corrections once they are um, on the limit. It is just important that you understand what is causing this and also to understand that in some cars you're gonna see, naturally you're gonna see a lot more of this compared to the others, also depending on the tires that you use. Now let's look at an example of the real data to identify what we just explained. So we have the reference lap in black and we have the corrected speed on, at the top and the steering wheel angle at the bottom. Once we look at the comparison lap in red, we can see the first thing that we see is the high amount of steering in three of the corners as you can see here. So we just discussed how an understeering car, you're gonna have more steering, but also how you're gonna get this more peaky behavior for the steering trace. So we can clearly see that here, even though it is the same car and the same setup, for one of the drivers, the driver in red, um, he's getting a lot more understeer. This could be coming from really the vehicle setup or the conditions or tire wear, or the driver himself could be inducing this understeer. We have a whole another video explaining how the driver can be inducing understeer or oversteer with the throttle or the brakes. The next thing we can see is oversteer correction or indication, as we can see over here. You see that this correction, even though the corner is to the right, he's steering to the left, meaning that he's applying corrections. So this is a clear indication of oversteering that section. But it is interesting to see how in these corners we can see big understeer for this driver in red, but also oversteering corrections. Again, this could be induced either because of the track, you might have some sort of um, bump or curbs in that particular section that is inducing the oversteer, or it could, could be because of how the driver is applying the throttle, for example. The last thing we see here is the high frequency corrections that we also discussed, which could indicate either the driver is driving at the limit or he's having some sort of oversteer or instability, or um, it is his driving style. It's just important that you discuss with the driver and understand what is, it, what is going on over there. Now, if we go to throttle application, what we should be looking at? First, we want to be looking at pickup. So where is the driver going back on the throttle is what we are calling pickup point. This is very important, not only because as we just said, it's going to influence the balance of the car, but it's all even going to change the behavior of the differential, where the driver is engaging the throttle or going back on the throttle is really going to influence the balance that he feels from the apex until the exit. The second parameter we should be looking at is the aggression, which is basically how aggressive the driver is when going back on the throttle. 
Is your driver very smooth and taking a long time to add more and more throttle or he's very aggressive when applying the throttle? Related to that, we are going to be looking the point at which the driver gets to full throttle. This is actually a very important parameter that we are following, comparing different drivers, because it really defines how much speed he's gonna get at that corner exit. And another thing to be mindful of is if the driver is too aggressive, for example, picking up the throttle too early or going full throttle too early, he might need to make corrections. And it's what we see here. With these corrections, the driver, he's going back on the throttle, he needs to lift, and then go back. So not only you see these corrections here, but it's gonna delay the real full throttle application point. And he's gonna be typically losing a lot of speed if he's applying, if he's doing these type of corrections as we're gonna see in the examples. So here, let's look at real data. Again, we have our reference lab shown in black and the comparison lab showing in red. We have the speed trace and then we have throttle trace. We can see that the comparison driver in red is trying to go back to the throttle a lot earlier, dozens of meters before he's already trying to touch the, the throttle and finding the point at which he can go back to the throttle. But we can see that even though he's doing that, he's never going to full throttle and he's taking a long, long time until he can get to full throttle. If we look at the speed traces, we're gonna see that he's carrying less speed in the braking zone. He probably notices that he's carrying less speed than the car would possibly carry, and then he's trying to go back on the throttle to make up for that. However, as we just said, applying the throttle is gonna influence the car balance, he's getting more understeer, he's missing his driving line, and then he needs to lift the throttle before he can go full throttle. So even though by going back on the throttle, he was able to have higher speed at the apex, because of these lift, lifts and taking a long time to apply full throttle, we can see here that he's losing a lot of time at corner exit. In this next example, we are gonna see an example of throttle understeer. So that basically the driver applying the throttle and getting understeer because of that. So here again, we have corrected speed, throttle position and steering, all of them together. The comparison driver in red is applying at the same point, but it's being more aggressive. And you guys remember how we split these different parameters to look at them separately. Pick a point the same, but a lot more aggression. This will cause, in this case, understeer, He's shifting the weight to the rear, causing understeer. And we can see this by the high amount of steering that he needs following the, this throttle application. So much so that he needs to lift the throttle so that he can, get, he can get back to his driving line before he can go back to full throttle again. And once more, he's losing a lot of time because of that. Because even though the speed was very similar over here, and he's actually gaining speed at the exit, because of this lift, you can see that he's losing speed. So he's gonna lose this speed all the way until the next braking zone. Now we are gonna have a case of throttle oversteer, which happens when you are, for example, at lower speeds or you have too much power and you saturate the rear tires. So we start this corner by with the red driver up carrying more speed, but this is inducing higher understeer. You remember that this higher steering angle is in indicating understeer compared to the baseline driver. And besides this understeer, or because of this understeer, the, the car didn't get rotated enough at the entry and at the apex. And when the driver tries to go back on power, their tires are still generating lateral force. So it's easier for the drivers to saturate the rear tires and cause oversteer. And we can see this here because even though the steering profile should be all positive on this left hand turn. We can see big corrections to the right, indicating that when he went back on the power, he caused oversteer. And as I mentioned, we have a whole video explaining exactly how the throttle, how the brakes are going to influence the car balance in different ways. Now, looking at brake application, let's suppose a typical brake profile, brake pressure profile, where you increase the pressure and then you decrease as you trail brake into the corner. Parameters we should be looking at. Braking point, and you all know that we're going to be comparing different drivers in terms of braking point. Then we are going to look at, again, aggression, how quickly the driver is jumping on the brakes and building the pressure. We're going to be looking at peak pressure and comparing different drivers to understand why one driver can get higher decelerations compared to the other. And we are also gonna focus very much in trail braking. Because the trail braking, how much the driver is carrying the brakes into the corners and how close to the apex he can get, is gonna influence two things. 
how much he can exploit the combined grip from the tires, but also how he's influencing the car balance with their inputs. Now, there is a last point that we should also be watching when looking at brake pressure, which gives us good indications of a few problems, which is double peak. As we can see here, this double peak happens when the driver, typically when the driver was braking too early, he notices that he lifts the brake and then he applies it again when he's at the correct speed. So this, this gives a good indication that the driver is braking earlier than needed, unless it is a specific braking zone that asks for such a behavior. Looking at real examples, again, we have the speed, but now the brake pressure profile. What we can see straight away comparing these two drivers, we can see how much more pressure the driver in red can apply compared to the driver in black. If the driver is applying higher peak pressure and is not locking the tires, it is going to get higher decelerations. By getting higher decelerations and being able to remove all that speed, this means that he can brake later and still get to the same apex speed. So if we zoom this section and we quantify the, the braking points, we can see that the driver in red was able to brake 15 meters later than the other driver because he's achieving this higher deceleration. So here we already analyzed peak pressure and braking points. The next topic that we should be analyzing is the braking aggression, but we can see that in this case the aggression is relatively similar. If anything, the comparison driver in red can also be a little bit more aggressive when building up the pressure, which is very important. And the last topic that we would like to be analyzing is the trail braking. So we can see that the driver in red is trail braking a lot more, exploring more of the combined grip of the tire, and because of that he's able to carry so much more speed at the entry. In this next example, we are going to be looking again at the comparison driver in red, and we can see that he was braking a lot earlier. And even more interesting than that, the driver realizes, lifts or removes some of the brake pressure until the speed matched what he, who, what he would expect from the car over here, and then he's going back on the brake again. As I said, this is a good indication that possibly your driver was braking earlier than needed, unless it is something that that particular corner is asking for. But you see a real example of double peak for the brakes. So we were able to analyze how the steering, how you can read the steering to analyze car balance, and what of the parameters you should be looking at when looking at throttle application and brake pressure application with these real examples. If you like this content, I'm sure you would love our seminars. We have two seminars to tell you about. The first one is the Data-Driven Performance Engineering Seminar. In this seminar, carried over three or four days, 10 to 11 hours per day, we discuss all things performance engineering. So not only driver inputs, we are going to be analyzing all the different aspects and techniques from data analysis, setup analysis, tire management, how to connect all of them and how to automate the process to use all these techniques and tools in the seminar. The other seminar is the Applied Vehicle Dynamics. The Applied Vehicle Dynamics gives you all the foundations that you need, not to only to understand car design, but once you have the, a car, how you can use all aspects of vehicle dynamics to improve and maximize its performance. If you're interested in any of these seminars, you're gonna find the calendar link in the video description. We teach them all over the world year long. And if you have any questions about the seminars, you can send us an email. Besides that, if you think that your team or your company could benefit from working with us, these are some of the services that we offer performance engineering, so you could have one of our performance engineers or race engineers at the track with you, applying all the techniques and tools that Optimum G uses at the track. We also do vehicle dynamics consulting, where we help companies to design cars, tires, tire selection, vehicle benchmarking, simulation, or anything else related to vehicle dynamics. And we also offer simulation software solutions related to vehicle dynamics, tires, and kinematics. All of that you can find on our website. And if you are interested, interested in working with us, you can also reach out at engineering at optimumg.com. Thank you very much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comment section so that I can get back to you. And I'll see you in the next one.